Hey guys, welcome back to Calgary Barbell. My name is Bryce, and today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the bench shirt. Now, if you missed the squat suit video, go ahead and check back through our channel. We did an in-depth analysis, uh, or sort of a beginner's guide for the squat suit. We're gonna do the same thing for the bench shirt today. So we're gonna talk about the different types of bench shirts, why you might want one cut over another. We're gonna talk about how to get into a bench shirt, and then we're gonna talk about warming up on the day, as well as some general and basic training guidelines for shirt adventures. So first things first, you need to get your hands on a bench shirt. Now, like I said in the squat suit video, the best way to do this is to try to find a community or some local people uh, or an online forum or some way to get a hold of secondhand stuff. Obviously, that's gonna be a cheaper way into equipped lifting, but if you're committed and ready to go for it, I'm gonna run you through some of the different ones that you can buy if you're looking to buy brand new. So the first generation of bench shirts from Titan was the F6 and the Fury. Now the Fury came first, and it was what's called a straight sleeve shirt. Now a straight sleeve shirt is intended for somebody who doesn't have much of an arch in their bench press because the sleeves are oriented straight out from the body. Now, when we get into what's called an angled sleeve shirt, then you're gonna get the right angle between the shirt and the arms or the sleeves uh, when you have an arch in your back. So straight sleeve shirt for a flat back bench presser and an angled sleeve shirt for somebody with a bit more of an aggressive arch. So, the Fury came first, that was a straight sleeve bench shirt, and then the F6 came along, and that was the first angled sleeve bench shirt, at least from Titan. Um, they are made of the same material, they're a generally similar shirt, but that's the biggest difference, is the angle of the sleeves. Now this shirt's gonna be a little bit less aggressive than the Katana, and there's three different Katanas we'll talk about. The regular katana, and these all these come in both straight sleeved and angled sleeved. This is something you choose when you order the shirt. So the katana is a thicker material, and that's the biggest difference between the older generation and the new generation. The katana is a thicker material. It has a little bit of a higher neck as opposed to the super katana. So the super katana uh, comes with a reinforced collar, and the collar is a little bit lower cut. So it's a, it's a step between the katana and the Super Katana low cut collar, which is the most aggressive shirt that you can get. It has the same reinforced collar, but the collar is again, even lower in the chest plate and comes right into the stitching uh, on the arms or the sleeves rather, right in the front delts there. So with that, generally it forces the user to wear the shirt lower, the lower the collar is. And the lower you wear the shirt, the more you can get out of it, but the harder it can be to use and the more weight you're gonna need to distort the shirt enough to get a touch. So for somebody just starting out, I might look at a Fury or an F6 shirt. If you're a little bit more experienced in powerlifting in general, uh, let's say for a male, if you have a 300 pound or more bench press, you can probably jump right into one of the Katana shirts. Now, personally, I got into the uh, uh, low cut Super Katana right away, and it was probably way too much shirt for me. Generally speaking, I had a lot more success in my earlier days with a regular Katana, because I was able to wear it a little higher, take a little bit of the chest plate pressure off and have an easier time getting a touch. I've since decided to transition into using a super katana, but not quite into the low cut territory just yet. Another really big component of choosing and purchasing a bench shirt or deciding which one you're gonna try out is gonna be the sizing. Now the sizing chart, similarly to the squat suit, is going to come in three different fits. You've got your meat fit, your comp fit, and your regular fit. Just like with the squat suit, they scale from loosest to tightest based on chest measurement. Now, the size, for the most part, refers to what we call the chest plate. Now, the chest plate is gonna be this piece of material here that stretches across the chest, as the name would suggest, and will dictate, essentially, how tight the shirt is overall. Now, for most beginners, I'm definitely gonna recommend a looser chest plate. For myself, when I was 99 kilos, my chest was 49 inches, and I used a 46 quite comfortably. Now that I'm back up to about 51 inches, I'm using a 48. Now I am by no means a bench expert. I do have relatively long arms. Now when you're sizing a chest plate, one thing you wanna keep in mind is actually arm length. 
We had Dylan in a bench shirt for a short little while there. He measured 44 around the chest. We got him a 46, thinking that would be enough to allow him to learn the shirt. But because of the extreme length of his arms, it still made touching very, very tough. So I'm gonna recommend if you have very long arms to size up an extra size, whereas if you have more like a bencher's build, fairly barrel chest, short arms, then you can probably go with something a little more true to size. So now that it comes time to get your bench shirt on, you're gonna want probably one of two things. Now these are called suit slippers. If you missed the squat video, these are essentially just slidey on the outside and sticky on the inside. So they stick to the skin. They don't move around too, too much when they're on, but they will allow the friction to be reduced when you're pulling your shirt up over them so that they slide on. Now a quick note with the suit slippers, if you're using the same ones you use for your legs, make sure that you leave a lot of excess material down near the wrist. If you pull all that material up and get it nice and tight, you're gonna have a hell of a lot of material to pull out once your sleeves are on, which is gonna be a pain in the ass. So leave the excess material bunched up around the wrist, put it on just high enough that it's gonna go uh, below where your shirt's gonna come on. Now, not everybody has suit slippers, and we talked a little bit about the option of using garbage bags or shopping bags in the last video, but I'm gonna kinda show you how you would go through that. So you're gonna find the corner of the bag and essentially just rip through like that. Get it up to about the middle of your forearm or so. And there, that's where most of the friction is gonna occur in the shirt. So when you get the shirt on, you want the cuff of the sleeve to be just above the bag so that it slides on with the bag. And then you're gonna have to try to pull the bag out from underneath, which can be kind of annoying. You might end up with little bits of shopping bags stuck underneath the sleeve. Uh, it's kind of a trade-off, but for somebody who doesn't wanna go ahead and get suit slippers, this is definitely a viable option. So, like I said before, I'm a guy who uses suit slippers, so now that I've got these suit slippers on, you're gonna wanna take your bench shirt. Now, I learned this trick from Mike T, and if you go back, way back through the RTS YouTube channel, you can find a video where Mike explains how he does this, and that's just exactly what I do. So you wanna take and fold the shirt about in half, like so. Once you've got it folded, and flat, you're gonna wanna take and roll the shirt on itself. Just up to about where you can start to see the seams for the insides of the armpits. Once your shirt's rolled up, you've got this little tab, so once it's on, you can grab it and pull it open. You're gonna take and go in one arm at a time. Now, it's worth noting that with a bench shirt, you can tweak or torque the bench shirt. So the more on the outside of your arm the label is, the easier it's going to be to touch, the less you're gonna get out of it. And the more to the inside the label is, the tighter the chest plate's gonna be, the harder it's gonna be to get a touch. So even within the same shirt, there are a lot of different ways you can manipulate it to make it give you more or less carryover. So this is a fairly tight shirt, so I'm gonna wear this logo pretty much right on top of my bicep. Not super in this way, and not super on the outside either. Once you've got one sleeve in, toss the other one in. Now for a lot of people, you might not be able to get into your shirt by yourself. You might want somebody to give you a hand, grab the sleeves. Um, if you can get some gardening gloves, they can make dealing with the material a little bit easier for your training partner or for yourself if you're helping somebody else into a shirt. Now that we've gotten it to here, I'm just above the elbow on both sides, which is legally where the shirt needs to go in order to wear it in competition. The elbow needs to be out. I'm gonna pop my head through. And we're in. Now, because I left that little tab somewhere right there. I can now grab that and pull the shirt down. Now this is my tight shirt, so it's quite tight on me. And there we go. Now there's a couple different tricks that you can do to help get the shirt seated a little bit better. So the number one thing that I like to do is I like to try to get the bar knurling right in the armpit, wedge it up in, 
and kind of swim my way through to get that sleeve seated a little bit higher. Again, the higher the sleeve is seated, the less carryover you're gonna get, but the easier it's gonna be to get a touch. The, vi the opposite is true as well. So the lower it is, the closer to the elbow, the lower you wear your sleeves, the harder it's gonna be to get a touch, but the more carryover you're gonna get out of the shirt. So once the shirt is seated to your liking and it's relatively close in the armpits, for a beginner, you're gonna want that crease right here to be pretty close up into the armpits, which means the sleeves are gonna go up fairly high. Once that's set, you're gonna again grab on the seam of your slippers and start pulling the material out. Now because I didn't stuff a whole lot of material up there, it's a little bit easier for me to get these out afterwards. And voila, the shirt is on. So the other thing that a lot of people like to use, and I use one myself, is what's called a bench belt. So that's going to set on there. It's really hard to get on yourself, so I'm gonna avoid swinging it around and hitting myself in the nuts. But uh, once it's on, it's gonna help kind of pull and hold the shirt in place while you're setting up and in between sets and etc. so it doesn't shift around too much on you. So you can keep the shirt where you want it. Now you don't need a bench belt. You don't need a thin belt. You can use whatever normal powerlifting belt you use, but with a bit of a thicker belt, I find it inhibits my ability to arch. So I like to use an extra thin belt. All right, so we've talked about what shirt you might want, why you might want it. We've talked a little bit about what each shirt does and the advantages and disadvantages of them. And we've talked a little bit about getting the shirt on. So the next thing we're gonna talk about today is warming up. So like with the squat suit video, um, I mentioned in that one that I'm a big proponent and a big fan of getting into the equipment early so that you can start to feel the groove out with lighter than maximal weights. A lot of times, especially with the bench shirt, you're gonna need a lot of weight to touch your chest generally. Now, if you just load that up, put it in your hands and hope for the best, you're probably gonna miss groove it. You're probably not gonna be familiar or comfortable with how the shirt moves your bar path uh, and where you're gonna need to touch. But if you start light, warm your way up through the shirt and in the shirt, by the time you get to a weight that's gonna touch or get close to touching, you're gonna be a lot better off. So for me, this means uh, I've got a 180 kilo, 185 kilo raw bench. I want up to about 150 kilos and then put my shirt on and jump up to 190 or 200 kilos. Now I know my shirt for a novice lifter, I'd probably recommend if you were gonna get into your shirt uh, after 150 raw single, I'd probably get up to maybe 170 and feel out your first few reps in the shirt. Now you may not even move the bar. I mean that, that bar might move two inches on each of those reps, but that's okay. Take three or four there, add a little bit more weight, try to bring it down a little further and work your way up. And that kind of takes us right into some training guidelines. Now, generally speaking with equipped bench, there are kind of two camps of people. Now I've played with and experienced both styles of training. I think each has their merit and potential disadvantages. So first off, we're gonna talk about those people who are big proponents of using boards and of board work to find the groove, to gauge your consistency, uh, or sorry, to, to help you consistently gauge how far down that bar is coming uh, and to give you a target to aim for. So these people will use uh, two, three, one boards, uh, et cetera, either in warmups or as part of training. So boards can be very useful um, in a new shirt where you're not able to get down to your chest. Now the other side of things, and this is what I've spent more time doing in my training, uh, is what we call ghost boarding. So you basically just take the bar to where you can and then press it back up. You have to kind of be able to ballpark, okay, that was a, about a two board, so I need this many more kilos to try to get a touch. But in my opinion, that gives you a superior or a more true to feel uh, idea of how the bar moves because with the boards I feel like you can kind of dump into them and you can get a little bit sloppy and start to use the boards to your advantage whereas without the boards you're very much responsible for being in control of that bar the whole way through. Now I can't really say that one camp or one style of training is necessarily better than the other but what I would recommend is trying out both styles. I think in some instances board pressing is more suited for some athletes whereas ghost boarding can be a little bit more useful for others. So as with equipped squatting in the bench shirt, I'm definitely gonna advocate the use of singles. Now, in a bench shirt, because of the nature of it, you have a window of what you can press. Now that window is gonna constitute a weight that's heavy enough that you can touch the chest, but light enough that you can still press it back up. Now using singles in the lower end of this range can be a very useful training tool to feel out where that window is and how close you are to the top of it. I also am an advocate for reps in a shirt. Now, generally speaking, or in most of my experience, uh, I've done ghost board reps. 
Now, I find these really useful for new athletes. A set of five, no boards. Just get them to take it as far down as you can. Now, that's gonna very much force you to use the groove of the shirt to get more comfortable with the groove of the shirt. And just like with the squat suit, by the end, it sucks, so you're more likely to come down a little bit faster and get closer to a touch. A lot of times I've had athletes struggle for a touch with a single and get a lot closer with 20 or 30 kilos lighter for a set of five because of how aggressive they're bringing the bar down. Now the next thing I'm gonna talk about is arguably the most important point that I'll make in any of these videos, and that is safety. Make sure that you're in a rack with safeties for your bench press. Make sure you have spotters for your squats and your bench press. Use side spots on your benches. Make sure that you've taken every precaution you can to make sure that you're safe. Now, when something goes wrong in equipment, I've seen equipment tear. Uh, I've seen people obviously dealing with 120, 130% of their max. Something moves slightly out of position, things come crashing down and it happens very fast. So make sure you're scheduling with your friends or training partners to make sure that you have spotters and always ensure that you're in a rack with proper safeties, using the right equipment, taking whatever measures you can to be safe. I, I simply can't stress that enough. Um, I'm sure you guys may have seen by this point my crashing to the ground with 770 and in my back. as I got about halfway up, I got stuck. Uh, one of my legs took a step and I started to fall sideways. Um, so I got, or sorry, I started to fall forward and sideways kind of at the same time. I got one side of the bar into a bench hook. We tried to get the other side into the other bench hook, but it didn't go. So that side ended up hitting the floor, fell backwards with the bar, and uh, it was pretty catastrophic. It was quite the yard sale. I never want to do that again. And uh, at that point, I realized that I needed to stop being a hero because regardless of whether the weight was very uh, well within my wheelhouse or not, things do go wrong in equipment. So be smart, be safe, have spotters, and use the right equipment. All right guys, that's it for us today at Calgary Barbell. Thank you very much for tuning in. I hope for anybody who's interested in equipped benching, we've given you a sort of roadmap or a place to get started with it all. And uh, we will be posting our equipped deadlift video next week. So stay tuned for that. If you have any questions, hit me up in the comments below. Leave a like if you liked it and share it with your friends if they're into equipped lifting. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.